Hello, guys. Welcome to the Waves webinar series. I'm Yoni. I'm going to be moderating today's event, which is going to be a good one on mixing dance music for clubs, presented by producer, engineer, and composer Dave Darlington. Before I introduce Dave, let me go over the format with you. If you've seen any of our past webinars, then you know that we used to combine the presentation and the live chat portion into one event. What we found is that so many people wanted the chance to ask their questions and interact with the presenter, that by the time we got done with the presentation portion, there wasn't all that much time left at the end. So we decided to record the presentation ahead of time, send it out to you for you to watch at your own convenience, which hopefully you've had a chance to do, and then you can prepare your questions in advance, and now we have the entire hour to do a Q&A get into it, and expand on the topics that Dave went into on the video. Feel free to submit your questions at any time. You can even start right now. But you won't see them right away in the chat, as they'll first go to me, and then I'll read them out to Dave one at a time. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can, but please keep in mind that we have a lot of people online with us today. So we do appreciate your patience while you wait to have your questions answered. Let's go ahead and introduce our presenter for today's webinar. He's one of the most multi-talented people I know. He does many things, and he does them all at an outstanding level. His resume as a professional basis ran, runs the gamut, ranging from symphony orchestras to jazz funk fusion projects, live tours, New York studio sessions. He's also earned critical acclaim as a composer for his work on the HBO series Oz, which many of you probably have seen. And he recently won a Grammy for his work as a mixer on jazz legend Wayne Shorter's Allegria album. Now that alone would satisfy most people. But Dave also happens to be one of the top guys in New York for mixing and mastering dance music. And he's been involved in this scene from the start, way before we ever heard the term EDM. So we're in for a real treat today because we've got somebody who knows music, he knows engineering, he knows how to make a dance track sound like it should. And best of all, he really knows how to explain what exactly he's doing and how you can take those concepts and apply them to your own music at home. So please welcome everybody, Dave Darling. Hi, Yoni. Dave, how are you? Thanks for that embarrassing introduction. I hope I can live up to that uh, that billing. Embarrassing, but but well earned, well deserved. Um, before we get started and jump into these questions, and I see that that we've got a ton and a lot of good ones, uh, I just thought it might be a good idea if we could start off just maybe say a few words about how you know you went from all these different areas and styles of music and, and getting into dance and sort of what exactly you do today and kind of how you got there. Sure. I mean, like anybody's uh, career, it's been a little bit random and a little bit lucky. I grew up in uh, in Miami, Florida in the late 60s, early 70s, and that was kind of a hotbed of of rock and soul and funk, and there were some great players. That was when Jocko was growing up, and there was quite a bit going on. That's where I really learned to play and, and, and developed a love of music. And after I went to college, I, I wanted to play upright bass, so I went and asked if I could borrow an upright bass from the music department. And they said, sure, as long as you play in our orchestra, you can have an upright bass. <laughs> well, I, said, well, I, can, I can do jazz and, and learn a little classical. So I really caught fire into classical music at, for a few years there, and I ended up graduating and playing in some orchestras. I played in uh, the Tampa Symphony for a few years after graduation. And I started looking at the string players, the older string players, and they were not the, not the most happy people in the world because although classical is very demanding, you're kind of underneath the maestro your whole career. You, you've practiced all your life to get great, and now you're a servant to the maestro. So I said, not, maybe not for me. So I packed up, drove to New York with my basses and my amps and stuff, and just started meeting people. And... Um, as I was playing around and, and doing gigs and stuff, I started making demos, four-track demos, eight-track demos, and just learning how to make records sound good, you know, how to make live music sound good, how to make records sound good. And little by little, I got my foot into the studios with people whose demos I had made. Why don't you come with us when we're recording? Maybe you can be helpful, blah, blah, blah. Looking over the bigger engineer's shoulders, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, in the... In the 80s, a lot of those big engineers were very, very kind and helpful, showing me stuff that I wouldn't have known how to do without them taking time to explain it. So I kind of feel that's a really important part of the legacy of, of all of us making music. You know, we need to share. Instead of covering up our secrets, you know, you can't do this the way I do it. I'd rather everybody share it, and you're going to have a lot of new ideas from young people and experienced people. So that's kind of the route I took. 
and uh, it was it was very lucky. Okay, great. Well, I'm sure that's uh, you know interesting for everyone to hear, and uh, you know maybe they can get a little uh, hope out of there that they too can make it to where you are. Let's. Uh, I'm looking at the questions here. We're going to jump into it, and let's find a good one to get started. I think this is actually going to something a lot of people are probably wondering about, um, especially as we're talking about mixing dance music for clubs. It's from Adrian, uh, who asks, are you boosting or cutting specific frequencies to adhere to the acoustics of a club environment? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, when you're mixing, you're in your studio with your monitors that you've purchased. And when you're in a club, you're in a, an entirely different uh, environment. You have to, I kind of learned this early in the dance, in the dance uh, world. And like in the 80s, we would, we would mix all day to tape. And we'd get it sounding good in the studio, and then we'd run over with a cassette or a, an acetate to the club, and we'd play it in the club. And we're like, hmm, the bass is not right, the hi hat is not right. The trick is really to, to tune your room, and this is a this is a trial and error kind of thing. You have to make your room sound very accurate to the kind of music that you plan to be working on. So you need to be able to mix your stuff in your room as best you can, and then you have to have an access to the performance element of it, like you got to know some DJs or if you yourself are a DJ, you got to play it out in a couple of different clubs and say, okay, what's working and what's not working and then pinpoint why. If you take your mixes out and they're really bassy in the nightclub, that means you don't have enough bass in your room because you're boosting bass in order to make it feel good in your room. Then when you get out there, you have too much. Vice versa, if your vocals and your high end stuff is shrill in the clubs, that means your room is too dark. So you have to use the settings on the back of your speakers. If you have two-way speakers, you have to, you know, try to set them to be more more flat. Uh, another thing you can do is called real-time analysis, which is um, it's a box that you can probably rent from a local uh, audio rental place. Which you put pink noise through your system, weighted weighted pink noise, which is all the frequencies. It's like white noise, but all the frequencies have equal energy, so it's a little darker. And then you put a test mic where you're sitting, like an Earthworks or something that's very, very flat. Connect that to the box, and the box reads out the frequencies that are in your room. So you might see like a readout at 1K might be very hot. And you can put a graphic on your system, a graphic EQ, and dip that down. The idea is to get all the frequencies of the pink noise to be very even in your room. So there's not too much highs, there's not too much lows. All the frequencies of music are represented, and then your room is true. At least, at least in your listening position, never going to be true all the way around the back because of the shape of the room. It's always going to be a little bass here in the back, which might be good for clients. They can get a little more boom if they sit back on the couch. But basically, where you are has to be has to be the truth. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense, and you know, I think we all know it. Uh, or, or we'd like to know that it starts from the room and you got to know what you're hearing. And I think this next question kind of stays in that direction um, and talking a little bit about translation. It's, uh, it's from Ross G. It's asking, with dance music being primarily for sub-heavy clubs, how do you balance the bass so it works great in clubs but also sounds good on sub-lacking home systems like iPod headphones, small speakers, etc.? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough call. Um... The clubs are going to boost the, that sub energy below below the hearing level, and like lower than 60, lower than 40 hertz. So I, the, one of the biggest problems with dance music producers is they try to make so much sub in the kick and bass together, because they're you know they want the kick to pump and then they want the bass line to pump. But when you add those two together, you're getting way too much in a certain area. So one trick is to have them be in different. Like the kick could be low and the bass a little higher, or vice versa, a punchy high kick with a low sub bass. That's a pretty good trick. And um, I also listen in headphones a lot because speaker systems aren't going to have quite as much sub as headphones. You know, a, a pair of of really um, true headphones. I like I like these particular uh, Sony seventy five oh sixes, but. I asked a bunch of mastering engineers what they use, and um, this was one of the brands that came up. Of course, there's a lot of great brands out there, but you don't want the headphones to be hype. But you will hear more extremes. There are going to be more top-end, and there's going to be sub 
in the headphones. So I get it. I get it going good on the speakers, and I try a bunch of different speakers. I think I talked about this in our last webinar that you know I have Yamahas, I have Genelex, I have a little radio. I send it over to a, a laptop or an iPod to listen. You can um, you can actually broadcast your mixes using software and hear them on 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 somebody's uh, laptop connected to your system. Okay. I was gonna say, if you put on all those systems and then check the sub in the headphone, you're usually gonna be okay. Okay, good, great tip. Uh, and this is sort of, uh, you know, I'm gonna try and go through these questions and maybe seg some of them together. So as, as we're talking about the bass, we have another question now um, from Wayne, and he would like to learn how to get the kick and snare sound as full and in your face like Dead Mouse does. How would I do that? Are there different samples layered with different plugins on each? Thanks, Wayne. Uh, the kicks, kicks a lot of times are layered. I mean, there's a, a million sample packs out there, and people even sample the last great record that they heard and try to isolate the kick and just use that. So the kicks that you're going to get in a modern sample pack are very, very processed already. They have good transients, good sub. The sidechain thing that we went into in the video portion is very, very important that way. Um, I like to send my various instruments through groups. So we have a drum group, we have a bass group, we have a keyboard group, and all of those have a compression, uh, some sort of compressor on them that, which is controlled by the kick. And you can, you can control the amount with the threshold knob. And in fact, a lot of producers even use a separate kick track that always is on, even during a breakdown, which you don't hear in the record, but it's, it's sending control information on the quarter notes to these compressors. So that every time the kick hits, the bass goes slightly down just for that little instant and then lets itself back up. And if it's extreme, you that's when you get that pulsing, that LFO pulsing that we hear in modern dance music. You know, it's usually much more extreme on the keyboards, on the pads and stuff. But I put it on the bass also just to get the bass out of the way of that initial smack of the kick, which gives you the transient, gives you the information, and then the two of them combine to get the low end. Well, here's a, a follow-up question on that from, from Israel Navarro. And he says, hi, Dave. I was wondering, what do you think of the CLA compressors and about sidechain capabilities, if any, for bass stuff? Hmm. I, don't, I don't know the CLA sidechain uh, stuff. I do use the compression in the CLAs, um, especially the bass and the, uh, the vocals. I just find that they really are um, musical. That, you know, one of the things that with all the artist series that, that are out there from Waves is that the these guys are pro pros and they only do things to the music that is enhancing the musical aspect of it, not just frequency. They're not they're not thinking about the science as much as the art. So when you have those those three settings on the compression, the smack, and all on the on the CLA and uh, you know the Maseratis, all those they're very very musically. Uh, enhanced. So what I do is I find the, which band I like for that particular application and I start low and I just keep increasing it until it works. For the Okay. What, uh, from, I think his name, Phil is asking what type of parallel compression are you doing for kick, bass, etc.? Uh, I set up two, usually I set up two parallel compressors at the beginning of the um, mix and I use our compressor on for the uh, drums, and I use um, our Vox for the vocals. So they're they're coming up on aux channels with their own sends, and they're on really extreme settings. You know, like uh, very high ratio and a very low threshold. So as soon as we start to send sound to them, they're moving a lot. And then I don't put them up very loud in the mix because you're really just adding a little bit of mid punch. You know, you 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 have to just do that to taste. Um, and I send, I definitely send kicks and snares and like tom fills and stuff like that. Not so much the cymbals and ambient stuff. Another thing you can do if if you have um, an extra reverb, you can send it, send all your drums to a room reverb, a very short room reverb, and then smash that as if you had a room mic. Drum kid for like the rock guys do that. They put a, a mic out in the room. And then really squash that and roll off the highs and lows. You, you really just want a mid punchy sound of you know just that mid smack of the drums, and then you bring that up into the mix, and you'll you'll be able to know when it's 
when it's too far because your drums will start being a little too thin. And okay. the, the software has delay compensation. Back in the early days, if you did that, you would get a phasing issue. But nowadays, if you put the delay compensation on, it's fine. It works great. Yeah, actually, I saw a question here about phasing uh, that uh, I'm going to try and find it. If I uh, Okay, here. Uh, from, they didn't put their name in, so I guess anonymous. But the question is, the word phasing gives me a panic attack, and then that affected negativity, my decision making when it comes to mixing. Can you talk a bit about that? And can phasing cause mid-range muddiness? Okay, phasing. This is interesting. I'll tell you a little story. Um, my one of my early mixes, I had the background vocals very wide and very glamorous, and then I heard the mix on a mono radio in my car. It was like great. My song's on the radio, and there was absolutely no background vocals in the mix because they were so wide, they were completely out of phase. What phase really is is the forward and backward movement of the wave in the speaker. So you have two speakers in stereo. You want the kick drum to push this speaker forward at the same time as it pushes that speaker forward, which in a mono, of course, it's going to hit. But in a stereo, if one's going forward and one's going backward, that's called cancellation because the net result is null. As opposed to this, you're getting this. That's, that's what out of phase is. So let's, let's, for an example, let's say you're layering two kicks. You, know, you can see the wave. So the kick one has to go up at the same time as kick two. If they go up together and down together, they're not going to stay in the same, but at the transient, at the beginning, they have to be in phase so they both push the speakers forward. If the kick that you're layering is going down while the top kick, the first kick is going up, then this kick is pushing the speaker backwards on the initial attack, and this speaker is pushing this kick is pushing the speaker forward on the initial attack, so you have less power. So um, yeah, you got to you have to be very careful of that when you mic a real drum kit. You have to make sure all the mics, as the guy strikes the snare, all those cymbal mics and everything all have to be moving in the same direction at the same time. That's correct. I think that was one of the best explanations of phasing I've ever seen without any kind of visual aid or plug-in or anything at your disposal. So <laughs> hopefully uh, you guys sort of understand that a little bit better. And uh, and going staying staying in that route a little bit. Um, Mike M is asking, how do you get stereo mixes to work in mono-wired clubs? Well, you have to have a way to check. You were, uh, I actually have a um, old O2R that's actually my, just my monitor board, which has a mono button. So at the end of a mix, or you know, clo getting, when I'm getting close to the end of a mix, I pop it into mono to make sure that none of that widening stuff that I'm doing is, is too much. And that goes that goes back to the, my story about the background vocals actually disappearing because they were so wide and beautiful, and you know a lot of people do do tricks like that these days. I think I showed some of that in the pads and stuff on the on the video portion where I delay one side so it starts to be a little bit out of phase, but in stereo it sounds gorgeous. The the S1 is is doing that a little bit too. It's just it's not going out of phase, but it's just tipping it, which gives your ear a certain sense because the sound hits this ear slightly sooner than it hits this ear. And that makes it super wide. And when I listen to dance records now that I like, some of the engineers that are out there that I like and the producers, I go, wow, that's super wide. How do they do that? But you, it's a really good question. You do have to be careful that when you go to a club that's that's wired in mono, it doesn't. The way to do that is to check. Even if you even if you go on your master fader and fold it down to mono, if you don't have a way of doing it um, with your equipment, just go go to that master bus and, and put the panning up to the middle and see what happens. Okay, let's actually talk a little bit about um, panning and, and a little more on the drums here. Uh, Someone is asking: Is there typically a formula to follow when panning your drums, like center kick and snare? Or do you duplicate hi hats and pan left and right, or is it kind of a protract thing? Well, as specifically, dance is different than acoustic. You know, rock, rock, you try to mimic the kit. You're either looking at it from his, the, the, dr the drummer's point of view, where the hi-hat would be on the left, or you're looking at it from the audience where the hi-hat would be on the right. Typically, in dance, you have quite a few elements other than the kick and snare. So for me, kick and snare clap are almost always up the middle, because that's where the power is going to be. And then I try to, to fan out the upper elements 
put the hi hat opposite the shaker. A lot of a lot of dance producers use a couple of different hi hats to get some motion. So you know you want to try to balance those elements: the tambourines, the shakers, the the, the loopy stuff. You know, some something you might get out of a stylus, which has a lot of high end energy. You want to be able to get those elements out of the way of each other, and just you have to just ba you know experiment to create energy. Cool. I, I just want to mention, I saw a couple people asking uh, for a link to the original video that you're talking about, so I did just put that in the chat. If anyone wants to check that out afterwards, you can feel free. Um, and, and, you know, there's everything that Dave is talking about, he really goes into detail on that video. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit, bit about vocals. And this is sort of a general question. Okay. Um, how do you achieve the sound that most vocals in dance music are in? I could tell it's a lot of compression, but what is your general process? What frequency ranges and how many compressors do you use or what compressors do you use? It sounds like they're asking for a gen your general approach to vocals. General go-to stuff. Okay, first of all, you're, all, you're always going to roll off a lot of mud at the bottom. You know, there's not really any music below 40. And in instruments, we need that sub below 40, but in vocals, we kind of don't. A lot of it depends on how you've mic'd it and how, how clean it is going in, which I think I touched in one of the videos about, you know, the quality of your front end, good mic, good mic pre. doesn't have to be super expensive or super vintage, but it has to be good. And the space that you're in has to be good. You know, those, those um, reflection filters that are out now, those are very popular and, and very good. You don't want a roomy sound. That's the hardest thing to get out is a, is a bad room. If she, if the girl's a little too close to the mic, or the guy, or the rapper's spitting, you can you can get that out by rolling off the bottom. So, roll off the bottom. You generally enhance a little bit of highs somewhere between five, eight, ten k. Then, where the meat of the vocal is is one one between one point five and say three k. And there, there's also going to be a shrillness. So I do what's called subtractive EQ. I think I go through this in the video. You make a very narrow cue point and boost it way up. So now you've got a peak that, that you can sweep the frequency while the person is singing. And there's going to be a spot where it starts to really be shrill, like, like whistly. And that's what you want to get out. So you search around for the, the ugly point, that whistle, 2500, 2600. Then you, then you take that out just a few dBs, which makes the sound more easy on the ears. So that when you do add it, when you add a global brightness up below, above that, that whistling frequency doesn't hurt so much. Then, okay. of course, you want to compress. Um, there's a there's a number of ways to do that. I, I don't always do it the same way. Sometimes I compress a little bit before I EQ with maybe R compressor, like a, a, a ratio of two or three. Just bring the threshold down till you start to see it move. I don't like compression moving a lot on vocals because you, you start to hear it going in and out. You just want to kind of even out your wave and then, then EQ it, a little top end, roll off the mud out of the bottom. Maybe you need to roll off a little of the roomy sound. The roomy sound is going to be 300 or 400. I would do the same thing in the room. If you have a bad room sound, do the same sweep. When you start to hear that boomy sound, then you then you notch that out, and that'll get rid of that. And then follow it up with a, a like a high quality compressor, like the V Comp or you know the CLA 2A, something that really uh, mimics an analog compressor, and do another layer of of soft one or two dBs. Another good trick, which I find myself relying on more and more, is the, um, the Vocal Rider, which is really excellent. I I try to kind of have it on very lightly. I don't want it to be working against me, but I might put that on early in the mix and set the parameters pretty wide, so it's just you know raising up those soft notes and lowering those loud notes. A couple of compressors with an EQ, and then go into the automation and deal with the rest of it. You know, it depends on what music is behind you. Sometimes the vocal that sounds great in a breakdown will, will be inaudible in a, in a giant chorus. You have, to do, you have to do level rides to match your production. Cool. Um, this uh, I want to go back to kicks for a second because I saw this interesting question from more than one person. Uh, we'll take this one from Daniel, who's asking, "What are your thoughts on having the kick in the same key of the song in EDM?" 
that's interesting um my buddy dean who was uh in the in the his music is in the video yeah he, he asked me the same question and i thought hmm it's an interesting idea i don't really haven't ever done that or suggested that but i know that that's a new kind of style that's coming out from um i guess it's an outgrowth of the mixed in key thing where you know you you when you when you're playing djing you you're working in keys which is great because i think that introduces more of a musical sensibility to the whole DJ culture, you know, knowing what key you're in, what keys work uh, against each other. So um, I would just say uh, I'm for it. I'm, I'm actually, I actually think it's probably a good idea. I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Not all kicks actually have a, a real note that you can pinpoint the note, but the note would be that same way I'm telling you to, to sweep the room or the, or the harshness. You could be able to sweep on a kick and find the resonant note and then figure out from there what frequency that is. You can go online and find the frequencies to notes like, you know, like A440, that kind of thing. Cool. I'm, uh, I'm looking for some more. I saw a couple of the... That would be a great idea, you know, to help the, to help the music uh, be rich. Yeah, I found that interesting. You know, I think it's the first sort of style of music where you're actually, you know... Concept. For me, I think attaching pitch to a drums. Yeah, but it's good. Um, okay, so here from DJ Leviani. <clears throat> Hi, Dave. I've been I've been experiencing difficulties in mixing the bass and sub bass because some notes seem to be louder than others, even using the Sennheiser HD 650 headphones. How do you treat these guys? Yeah, that's that's a very common thing with um, with sub bass because it's just, it's usually like a sine wave or something and certain note will just be blasting loud. I I use actually automation in the in the DAW in Logic or Ableton or whatever. And I usually you're in you have a loop so it doesn't take that long, but you just listen carefully and you find the point of the loop. Start by compressing, right? Fre maybe even frequency based compressing like the C4 and try to narrow that that low mid notch to hit the note that's being too loud. If that doesn't get rid of it, you have to go in and automate and then copy the automation on a grid. Once you've got your loop, either either bounce it and print, you know, bounce it in place and print the new automation so the notes are even, or just copy the automation on the length of the song. But you know, back in the days of analog boards, you would sit there and ride that thing the whole song. Every every fourth note would be too loud. He's he's really right about that. That's true. That was an extra skill you had to learn to be an engineer yeah. back then. <laughs> um, we, uh, let's talk a little bit about synths. Uh, I just had this synth question and I lost it. Uh, oh, it would be, okay, here we go. The name is kind of hard to pronounce. Ragunath Rajam. It would be great if you could talk a little bit about how and when to use pads in the production phase and ways to mix that to sit well and blend in. I'm most interested in how to pick the kind of pad and how to mix it. Right. You know, pads are, are important to make the music sound full, but if they're too, uh, if the sound itself is too busy, it takes up too much room. So there's two ways to deal with that. Number one, you could layer a couple things, a nice warm pad layered with a fizzy pad. And the other point about that would be, Put, turn them off and play the section where the pads are going to play and then just bring them up slowly until they're taking up an, as much room as you need to make it sound full, but they're not masking all your little melody parts and your bass line and your, and your kick because it's, it's easy to glue up the middle too much. Uh, another, another thing you can do is some kind of um, harmonic excitement or, or slight harmonic distortion like uh, I use Renaissance Axe sometimes for that. It's, it gives it a little bit of an ampy sound, a little bit of a buzz, which creates energy in the middle and makes, makes warm pads and buzzy pads be a little more audible in the middle. And then they don't have to be as loud because they, because they have more energy there. Okay, staying on that, we have, we have a question from Michael Ross. It says, how do you achieve that ultra-wide sound on synths? Uh, stereo whiners just don't seem to reproduce that width. Huh. Yeah, I mean, there's. I think I did in the video the trick where you uh, put it through a stereo uh, delay. One side is not delayed at all, and the other side can be delayed anywhere between 10 milliseconds and let's say 30, 30 milliseconds. You start to hear it like that, but like 23, 24 milliseconds, 
it seems to get wider. That's a, that's an actually an old analog trick, but you know, I, I just do that with uh, with super tap or something like that. Okay. Uh, a few minutes ago, you talked about automation. We have a question here uh, that's asking. They didn't put their name in, but uh, how often do you find yourself automating EQ parameters to fit more sound into a dense mix? And when you do, specifically for automation purposes, do you have an EQ plugin that you favor? Uh, yeah, I use Renaissance EQ when I when I need to do that, and you you can just um, you know my my comfortable platform is Pro Tools. You just hold hold the Control Option Command and click that button in Pro Tools, and then then it becomes automated. I find um, I I use that more on vocals and stuff like that than I do on pads because pads tend to stay pretty um, pretty stable throughout throughout the part, whereas a vocalist could be really brassy on one note and then really dark on another note. But uh, sure, in a different section, a different part of a production, you know, maybe there's a lot going on, so you need a, a little aggressive upper mids or highs, and then you don't need that so much during a breakdown. Absolutely automate. I mean, these these are all tools to build the house. So you know, I would I would never say no. Don't use don't use the hammer. You know, of course, you know, whenever you can, and um, you know, keep it. I, w I would say keep it as simple as possible to get the desired results. Okay, let's, uh, let's try and take a few questions here on sort of the mastering uh, aspect of it. Um, first, we've got a question here from Ryan. who says, as a composer, I find it difficult to mix my tracks since I'm too close. Is it common for composers to stem out their tracks to be mixed by others? Um, well, when you say stems, to me that means grouping, um, you know, grouping like instruments together and giving you a two mix that that's the my when I say stems that's what I'm talking about a drum stem a keyboard stem uh, if you're talking about classical composition we do that a lot of times composers will just let me work producers will just let me work for an hour or two by myself I always like to start with their rough mix because in, especially in dance you know these take a long time to progress and they're developed over a long period of time you make the track then you make the arrangement then and you find a singer, and you then you fit the vocals. And so, you guys have been working on this stuff for days and days, sometimes weeks. So I would never do the kind of mix where I pull all the faders down and start over. I always want to work from from where you are, and then bring the tricks and the knowledge that I've learned over the years into into that environment, and try to just blow it up a little. You know, take take your vision and blow it up. His question seems to be more like, well, I'm so close to this work that I want to see somebody's new take on it. In that case, I might pull the faders down and, and redo it. But in complex dance music, I usually start where the producer is and go from there. Okay. Now, George Black is asking, uh, at the mastering stage, do you put on your mastering plugins on the master channel of the project or export the project as a wave file and re-import? I've seen people do both. Just wondering the difference. Uh, and that's a style thing. I mean, my style is in in the days of SSL, you put the you put the compressor on sort of towards the end of the mix after you've worked on all your sounds. These days, I put it on pretty early, and I, I went through my mastering chain in the video. You know, I, I use the Waves SSL compressor to hold the peaks down, and then I use um, the L3 quite a bit. Sometimes I use the L2, you know, a single band limiter at the end because it's punchy. It's very very punchy. The L3 being multiband has more um, control. Like you can shape, you can shape your last EQ a little bit. And I find myself using um, some EQ uh, at the stage before the compression on the master, even though I'm EQing the parts as good as I can. Sometimes a nice little bump on the top end and the, or bottom end at the end of the day goes, oh wow, now it, now it sounds even better. And I'm not against that at all. I I, I did want to make a point. Um, this might be a good time to do it. Is Make sure that you're not clipping your plugins. I see this so many times. In fact, there's even a funny picture circulating around where everything's in the red and the caption is, sounds great, bro. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound great when everything's in the red. You can always get the volume at the end that you need. But you know, leave yourself some headroom and especially check your plugins that the outputs, there's on, on almost all these plugins, there's a place to look at the output. Like you know, the the CLA two A has you know has the switch over there between compression and output, and make sure that you're not killing it and and, and introducing distortion that's just going to add 
head up over a bunch of tracks it to be a fuzzy, not clear thing. But this is especially true in the master. If you're going to put some kind of EQ first in the master, you don't want to be crushing that EQ and, and hitting distortion in the EQ before you even start to master the record. It's going to sound much better if it's clean, and then you compress it and limit it and get it loud and punchy. Okay, other, well, that, go ahead. I was going to say that that's a perfect lead-in for the next question, which is kind of a loaded one, but uh, from Jason Duncan. What level of loudness is standard for dance music? Okay, well, there's a brand new plug. Not brand new anymore, but uh, the Waves loudness meter is, is my new favorite meter because it's so accurate and so fast and um, I, I, used, I usually go to mastering when I'm allowed to when, when, the, when the client says you know we're gonna go to, uh, to a mastering guy and let's if you'd like to come and I always ask them you know what's your what's your level the, the WLM the waves loudness meter has a big readout of the RMS which is the average loudness you know you, you see your peaks and you see your valleys but you your average loudness uh, has to be between it has to be ten at least for dance, and you know people get up to seven and eight, which is really really loud. That means the average loudness of the record is never lower than minus eight or minus seven for, for an entire section of music, which is really loud. But if it's clean, it's good. There's nothing wrong with loud. We like loud. It has to be clean though. It can't. You can't just turn up the limiter and turn up the limiter. If it's if it's crunching and that for that you have to use these measurement devices your ears to decide how much crunch is acceptable to you as a producer. But if you look at the big the big guys that are out there now that you all listen to you know Dead Mouse and Swedish David Guetta those records are loud but they're clear they sound great they're not crunchy they're not distorted and when the singer comes in she sounds she or he sounds beautiful. The bass sounds beautiful. That's because they're they and the engineers they work with are smart and they don't distort their stuff un unless they're doing it on purpose, like an amp or a telephone thing. You know, of course we use that as a tool, but the general level of the master is not distorted. So, so in all, in all loudness is a good thing, but you can have too much of a good thing. Clean, if it's clean, clean is good. Clean. I mean, come on, we love rock. We love to go to the concert and get. <laughs> Uh, cool. Um, okay. Here's a, let's go back to synths for a second. A question from Johnny. How do you approach mixing heavy electro synths with a lot of frequencies such as saw and formant bases to make them in your face but not harsh? Kind of like what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I would limit those tracks with, with an, even an L1, a very simple limiter which was going to make the initial hit of the synth really speak and hold and hold the volume uh, at a general good level and then uh, part of that is production you know you can have one or two buzzy synths in a layer or two parts that do opposite each other rhythmically but have a buzzy sound but if you have a lot of things buzzing at the same time then that's that's a problem in production and that causes a problem for the mixer a lot of times the mix has to do with the production. So a lot of the producers that I work for are very good at, you know, the right kind of layer. Here's our here's our buzzy banging layer, here's our warm layer, here's our sub layer, here's our punchy drums. But not too much of the same kinds of things. The other thing you can do is layer them up in the arrangement so that at one point there's maybe one, then you bring in another one to kick the energy up, and then in the biggest point you have two or three that are really at that point very aggressive but you can't have eight minutes of that or, th or the people will tune out because it's not interesting. Um, sticking with synths, Luke is asking how do you EQ synths in general? I normally find them harsher than the high frequencies but when I cut the highs they sound dull. Where should I boost and cut so they can sound modern and bright in a mix? Okay, well maybe maybe it's not an EQ thing, maybe it's a multiband compression which is we talked about this in the video. It's a difficult concept to understand, but once you grasp what it's doing, it's going to be your favorite thing. And for that is the C4. It's got four bands, so you can you can turn off three of the. Let's say let's say you've got harsh upper mids. Turn off the bottom. Turn off the low mid. Turn off the high. Now all that sound is passing through, 
just turn on, on the upper mids and bring the frequency, I mean the threshold down, so that you see it start to work when those highs get aggressive. When they're not aggressive, they're going to pass through, and that's going to be the sound that you dialed up on the, on the synth. When they get too aggressive, the C4 is just going to hold them down that little bit. I think, I think that's, that's a, a difficult concept if you're not an engineer, engineer, and you, you want to just produce or DJ, but it's a very good thing to learn and, and use to your advantage. It works great on so many different things. Acoustic guitars that have too much finger noise, turn everything off, just do the, <coughs> the highs down, slide it over so it's only getting that really peaky, peaky stuff, not, so, not the strum, but the bad stuff from the fingers, and, and get it out of there. Done. You know, we, we hear that all the time from uh, a lot of our engineers that we work with, that their favorite plugin is like the C4 or the C6, you know. And a lot of people, I mean, we have so many really cool, you know, plugins that are modeled after gear and, and have great, you know, engineer names and, and right. that have worked with them. But And these seem like the more utility tools, but so many engineers rely on them because they can do so much. So well, The point is before, before the digital era, those things were, you know, very... Um, Hard to find. You know, you didn't see them. Only mastering engineers really even had them. You know, and there's 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 some good examples of uh, of hardware versions. You know, Tube Tech makes a great one. And but now with you know with with plugins, you can have them on a bunch of. Di usually, you had only one, and it was on your master, so you were correcting things in the master. Now you can have them on. I use them on my buses, on my keyboard buses and stuff, on my vocal bus. Or well, I would use them on an individual sound that changes over time and in, in not the right way. Good here, but it's not good over here. So let's just find what's not good and get that out or suppress it. Not remove it, but just suppress it a little bit. And, and I would just recommend to anyone, you know, if you're not quite sure how to use a, a C4 or C6, just pull up the plugin and pull up a preset. Um, you know, it might just get you in the neighborhood of what you need. I know there's a bunch of different presets, you know, vocals and, and different for kicks and different mixes. So you might find something that you can work with and then just twiddle the knobs until you Listen, sort of... I, I click on the question mark once in a while and I pull up the manual and I... Oh, oh really? Oh, that's what that... Does. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it a long time, but you can't know everything. Right. Like, you guys are developing plugins with a lot of different input from various people about different parameters that you can um, actuate. So, you know, there's, there's going to be things in all these plugins, especially the artist series that, you know, you don't really get what, of course, you get it out of the box, you turn it on, oh, great, great, this does this, oh, I love this. Then after you've used it for a while, hey, hit that question mark and, and get the PDF of the manual and scroll down and you might find out some really interesting stuff that you didn't know. Exactly, yeah. There's, there's no shame in using a preset to get started. Yeah. Um, so, all right, let's grab a couple more questions here. Uh, okay, I'm seeing this from a, a few different people as well. Uh, this is from Velizar. Do we want to, where applicable, get rid of the frequencies below 80 hertz, let's say of the kick, in order to make it fit with the bass? Often I found it difficult to fit kick and bass while keeping the energy of both. What would you suggest? Yeah. I think um, in a kick, you don't want to get rid of things below 80. That's a little bit high. You know, there's a lot of kick energy down at 40. There's a lot of kick energy in the sub. You might want to mess around with that on bass. The low, the low E on an electric bass is about 40, somewhere near 41 or something like that. So, um, you know, th think of that musically, like that low E being 40. There's going to be bass information higher than 40, everything from 40 and above. That goes back to what I had said earlier about maybe not having the kick and bass in the same place. Like a kick a kick that's focused low would go with the bass that's focused high. Um, what about I would this, definitely uh, off from 30 maybe because, you know, 30 and below is not really audible. That's just third. Well, what I was going to ask, we have a question from Ahmed that seems to be uh, asking the same question about everything else, where it says a lot of EDM mixers roll anything under 100 from anything other than bass and kick. Some even go beyond that. What do you think about this approach? Very good. I was going to say that, too. And get that stuff out of your synths. Get it out of your guitars or whatever, whatever other parts you have. You don't really need bass necessarily in your synths. And you'd be surprised how much that... I don't know if I would globally say it's it's 100 or it's 80, but it's somewhere in that 
second octave up from the bass, second or third octave up from the bass, and you just have to go. You have to go by um, just listening and experiment, but definitely clean out the mud and all those other things. Those parts don't need to be subby. They just need to be warm, and the warmth is down there in the in the 400, 500 area, not so much the 100, 200 area. I, I like this next question from Luca. Uh, he's saying, mixing techniques for dance music, are they suitable for rap music too? Sure. A lot, a lot of things are, 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 would carry over, um, especially the multiband compression for vocals and the um, parallel compression for vocals where you have a second compressor that's uh, you know, very strong but not so loud and you add, you send the vocal to that so it's adding a mid, a mid punch. Certainly, all the stuff we're talking about, the sub control, how to control the sub, maximizing the sub uh, while controlling it. And, and something that we haven't talked about in the question and, uh, period, but that I, I rely on heavily is the R bass to um, enhance maybe a bass down there or, or a bass synth that doesn't quite have that energy. Uh, put that on kind of lightly and, and use the um, amount to, to see what it's doing for you. Um. Here's a general question from John Evans. As a mixer, how long does it generally take you take for you to complete a typical EDM genre mix? Well, these days, you know, it comes to me so produced already. I would say th probably three hours. Usually, I, I, if somebody calls me from another country and says, you know, I like your work, how much to mix, and how how long does it take? I give them a day that I'm going to do it, and it takes me about three hours. And then, what I typically do, I send it back to them in the way I think it's done and then they say well yeah it's good but can you bring up a hi-hat a little bit but we go I always allow a period of going back and forth with the producer if they're not here with me sure. to get it done in the right way and um, you know I, I find that especially young producers who grew up on EDM are very smart in the things that they're doing and they, they're, they're very on point with a lot of this stuff it's really great they, they know a lot like sometimes we learn from them too <laughs> I don't have to do too much educating. I just try to take what they have and blow it up a little bit. Cool. Um, so, just gone six is asking, what are some of your go-to reference mixes? That change, it depends. I mean, I, I would even hesitate to say. You know, some of the pop stuff for vocals. You know, some of the Gaga and, and Katy Perry and stuff that's dance based. You know, it's got the four on the floor and stuff, but it's it's loud and bright, and the vocals come straight through. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> Not what about I, I saw someone ask. I'm looking for the question, uh, like engineers and producers that you might listen to or, or take things from um, in dance music. Or, well, you know, I mean, Manny Manny Moroccans does Bruno Mars stuff. I listen to that. He's he's awesome and. Uh, those vocals sound great. Um, we, the producers that I work for, generally have their likes and dislikes, and the kind of genre that they're going in. You know, there's a lot of a lot of different subgenres and stuff. And, you know, of course, all the big names. Um, you know, Dead Mouse and Swedish House Mafia I already mentioned. And those guys are, those guys are already famous and rightfully so. That, but they're not only famous for their mixes; they're famous for their productions because the music takes you on a journey. You know, and the, Everything about it is interesting. The sound choices, the musical aspects of the parts. The parts are just not dumb loops. They're actually, they're actually compositions. Even if it's a four-bar chord progression, they're really good, good chords. Interesting chords. It's musical, it's yeah. Musical, yeah. That's my point. But you know, usually I take my cues from the producer that I'm working for. As an engineer, I, I like all kinds of music, and I, I think you can find a value in just about any successful commercial record. The reason, there's a reason that it's successful. You shouldn't say, well, he doesn't deserve that success. They do deserve that success, and it's up to you to figure out why. Good advice. Um, I'm just looking for a last couple of uh, couple good questions to fill it in here. Uh, OK, I talked a little bit about uh, using limiter. Chris is asking, what is your ideal limiter ceiling on the stereo bus for dance music? Um, well, it's changing over time because things are getting louder and louder. It used to be like three, now I'm in the fives. But I, I go back to the WLM, the meter. That's kind of the that's kind of the arbiter. You know, you have to 
you have to use the, the measuring tools that we have, um, and the mastering guys will, will tell you the same thing. They, they watch the meters as in addition to listening. You know, they use their ears, and they're very skillful that way, but the meters tell you the true story because, you know, it's a, it's a physical physics medium. There's only so much energy we can get out of the wave, and, and the, the RMS is really telling you the story of apparent loudness, like how loud does this music sound? Another thing I would point out is that an empty record can be just as loud as a thick record. In fact, sometimes more so because um, the sounds can hit harder. There's more room for an individual sound to hit very hard. I'm trying to think of a good example, like a, like a black coffee record, you know, like a very dubby, emptied out record where the kicks are there and then the vocals come in. And mm, Those records are minus eight, minus seven. RMS, they're very, very loud and sound great. Well, less is more. It's more room for it to come through. If you're having trouble getting volume, you might want to think about maybe the arrangement is too thick. That, that works well in any style, right? I would say that's global, yeah. Um, okay, a question from Mike. Getting back to vocals, what types of delays do you use to create ambience, and around what milliseconds uh, do you find you use most? I generally set the delays. Um, by tempo. Um, I'm kind of hooked on H delay lately. That, that's kind of a tape based, you know, it's, it's modeled after it's kind of a tape based thing, which is um, somewhat warmer. And I also filter it. There's, there's filter controls right on the H delay on, a, on another, uh, uh, unlike the super tap, you know, you might do a bass roll off or something. If you need just a generic setting for a shadow, that's somewhere between. 200 to 250 milliseconds, just a quick, a quick eighth note. If you're looking for Elvis Presley, that's a little quicker, like 150. But if you're looking for something in, especially dance and EDM, you definitely want tempo based. So, um, depending on the song, I would put the H delay, lock it to the tempo, and an eighth or a dotted, sometimes a quarter. Some of my producers really like, like that quarter note, where you actually hear the repeat of the lyric. Um, the other producers I work for don't like that so much. They feel that that's an old school funk. That's more like a funk, a funk uh, style. And we use, and for them we use, I use a dotted eighth note where, you know, there's a delay, but you don't quite hear the word again because mm -hmm. some other information happens on the next quarter. Great. Um, question. One other point. Sorry. Sure. No, no, go on. Another good thing to do with the super tap is to put. A quarter on one side and an eighth on the a dotted eighth on the other side. Something that's pretty close. And then you have to adjust the um, the feedback because one of them will die quicker than the other one. You want them to, you want them to both die at the same time. But by that you get a you can and then pan those wide. You get a width going on there that seems spatial. It's almost like a it's basically like a reverb, like a reflection of a reverb, but it's in time. So you know, ba 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 like that and, and panned. That's another okay. good trick in space and vocals. Excellent, excellent. Um, so a question from Pavonis. I hope I said that right. More of a production question, but I was wondering if you have any tricks to get a virtual bass synth sound to sound a little more fat, like it's from an old analog synth. Thanks, of Stephen Stefan. Uh, my um, a, a lot of basses. I'm going to use um, the Waves guitar amp. I don't know if you guys ever went past those early presets that have the guitar distortions and everything, but if you go down, there's a whole bunch of bass amps, and man, are they good. I use them all the time, especially on real bass. This question is about virtual bass, but on real bass, they're amazing, and there's a whole Motown setting. There's a whole Motown set, and they are killing. The Jamerson preset is as if James Jamerson plugged into that wall socket right next to you. So I would exp I would experiment there, and they, it, there's also a di a a, um, a direct uh, pot on the on the plugin, so you can dial in your direct sound as much or as little as you need. But uh, check out the the, the these uh, those um, first couple of sets of uh, bass, which are direct and activator, meaning you know active active coil pickups, and those work great on synths. They sound amazing, but yeah, you, you, get the, you get the feeling of the air moving that you don't get in virtual music. That's kind of the difference between virtual and acoustic music is that the air is not moving and hitting the microphone. So we don't get those waves bumping into each other. We get a pure wave. 
which is great. But if we're trying to knit things together, we kind of we kind of need that jumble of things. It's it's mixing. It's not separating. So yeah, you know, as soon as you mentioned the GTR base, I immediately thought of the Motown name because I, oh, I love that. I know a lot of people I, I, I'm think that. I just think I, I you brought up something, you know, that's uh, uh, good for people to know. You know, it's Waves GTR, and it, yes, it, it is a guitar tool, but there's so many all the pedals in there. I mean, I know so many guys, myself included. They use them on keyboards, on vocals, and everything. It's almost, you know, uh, we yeah. should have released two different products, the GTR and then, like, GTR for other instruments because it's, yeah. it's really it's very useful. Definitely, that's an, that's really brings up another point is to maybe think outside the box. Okay, this plugin is designed for this, but what about what about that? I mean, sometimes I get mixes from people where they've completely misused the plugin. I'm fine with that as long as it's not clipping. Clipping right. is my, my main problem, but if they're, if they're using us... A C, you know, a Maserati vocal on an acoustic guitar, and it sounds killing. Why not? Why not? Exactly. Um, cool. So we've got a few more minutes here. We'll see. Grab a few more questions. Uh, it's from Jack Munro. Being a home producer, how or what is the best thing you can tell to do on our tracks to be ready for master through a, a real master studio like yours. I think it's just asking how to prepare his tracks. How to prepare. Yeah, OK, there's a, there's a few things. This is a very good question. It's important in the new world. And it's it even not only for the mix engineer, but what about collaborating? You know, what if you know your favorite vocalist is in, in Australia and you're in Europe? You know, how do you get that session to them in a timely way, in, in, the, in a way they can use? OK, number one, if the production is, is advanced and and you're kind of settled, then then bounce the stuff to audio because it's going to travel and, and be right. Um, number two, make sure you plug you have um, plugins that everybody has. Ty you know, type type an email to the mass to the mixing engineer and say, you know, I have Waves Platinum. Do you have Platinum, or do you, you know, should I should I bounce with the plugin in or not? My rule of thumb is. If it's an effect, like an, ec an echo or a flanger and everything, go ahead and commit. Don't commit to your EQ and your compression, because I might have different opinions about that. But if you've got, if you've got a sound that's a flanged Rhodes, and it's, it's, you wrote the whole song around the flanged Rhodes, don't make me look around in my flanger box to find the same flanger you had on your demo, because I'll, I'll never get the same one. So um, yes, bounce to, bounce to audio when possible. Especially uh, soft synths. There's, you know, a million great soft synths on the market, but not everybody has the same ones. Not everybody has the same versions. So you might have a newer version than I have, and it's not going to come up. And I might not have the same presets. You have Logic has a really good um, save as function where you save the the IR responses and the um, EXS samples and everything. So definitely do that. If you have Logic, you have the EXS. And, and Space Designer and all that. If you have Pro Tools, you have the basic Digi stuff. And since we're all in this forum, we all have some, some bundle of waves. So just type an email and say, I'm using this, 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 and this. And whatever the engineer doesn't have, you have to re you know, reduce down to an audio. Make sure you don't clip it. Cool. Um, I'm going to read you a question that I think we get in probably every single webinar. So I know people are always curious about it. Um, this is from Jamie Lennox. What is your strategy in choosing between either a bus compressor like the SSL compared to using a multi-channel compressor like C6 for buses and master tracks? How do you how do you know? How do you choose? Uh, I don't I don't necessarily dis discount one for the others. On my master bus, I would often use not always, but often use both using the SSL first to just kind of smooth everything out. There's there's Speaking about presets, there's some pretty awesome presets in um, in the SSL compressor, but it really depends how much program material you're sending through it and at what level you're sending through it. You have to you always have to adjust the threshold and the makeup gain. The makeup gain is to to put back the amount of gain that you're taking out, so that the level going in is the level going out, but you're smoothing out the dynamics. Now you can also use that makeup to get gain if you need gain or to reduce gain if you need to reduce gain but the main point of makeup is exactly what it says making up the difference so I would say I would say I would rely on a combination I would I would do the SSL first and then at the end the um, the l3 
Okay, great. So we're going to wrap things up here with one last question. I think it's a pretty good summary. Uh, it just They're asking if there was one thing you would like the audience to take away from this seminar, what would it be? Uh, I don't know if there's one. There's probably <laughs> Final words of wisdom. With the plugins. Uh, the arrangement is just as important as the mix. If you're having trouble with your mix, look at your arrangement and make sure, like we talked about, rolling off lows out of things that don't need lows and things like that. Um, set your gain structures so that everything is operating very comfortably, not in the red, and then we will get the, we'll get the gain at the end. You can't send a file to a mastering engineer that's at zero because he can't put any plugins on it. They'll clip. You have to, you have, to have headroom. Arrangement and headroom. Excellent, excellent. Now, I, I know there's still some, uh, you know, not everyone got their questions answered, but I would like to say, you know, this has gone so well, and if there's enough of a demand and you guys want more time, then just let us know, and we'll hold another one of these. I, I know Dave is, you know, always really cool and, and ready to... Back to what I said before, you know, guys out there are very well educated, and there's so much resources on the net. You know, if you want to learn how to work a plug-in or why a plug-in is emulating an older piece of gear, you can, you can find that on the net, and... Guys who make music these days are very motivated and they're very well educated. So you know, let's let's all just use all the tools. It's just tools to build the house. The one final thing we want to uh, a couple of people were asking, how can they contact you? Uh, some people might have a mix or two they want to send you. And uh... I have a website, uh, www.davedarlington.com. Okay, I just put that in the chat. Okay, there's an info info at Dave Darlington that forwards to my personal email, and um, you know, please any any and all any and all takers. If it's just a question, you know, when I have time, I'm happy to answer you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dave, very much. I'm gonna wrap things up here. Uh, just say a few last words. Um, thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. Uh, here's our link to our YouTube channel where this webinar should be up for viewing in just a matter of minutes. I want to put this in the chat for you. Uh, let's do this. Okay. Now, I also put up earlier in the uh, in the chat. I know you guys are wondering. Well, we've been talking about a video that all this is based on. This was the original video that Dave did for us on mixing dance music, mixing dance music for clubs. So let me put that link there again. I highly suggest you go check that out. There's just like a ton, a ton of good info there. And also be sure to look out for upcoming webinars on a variety of topics. You can view previous ones right now by putting this link, by going to this link that I'm putting in the chat. Okay, and we've got all, all kinds of topics, all kinds of styles. Um, what else? I wanted to give you guys a couple more links. Ah, here we go. If there are any ways, plugins that you would like to demo, you can download anything free, seven day demo. Just go to this link. Right here. Okay. So that is all. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Dave, thank you once again for, for this amazing, amazing chat. It was super helpful. I myself learned a ton always, so I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thanks everyone. See you next time. <laughs>